Okay, so thank you, Sharif Ismail, for speaking to the uh, SSR SIG today uh, with the topic vaccination delivery system responses to, oh, uh, just left my uh, topic, sorry, vaccination delivery system responses to compound shocks, multi-level pathways influencing system resilience in Lebanon. So uh, very interesting topic. I'm looking forward to hearing and I will push it over to you. And I see the, the share screen is working. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just double check? Thank you. And that's, that's really helpful. Can I just double check which screen you can see at the moment? Right now I see the screen that says multi-level perspectives on health system resilience. Right. So just the slides, not the not the notes, which oh, is what yes. Martha, perfect. <laughs> okay. Um great. Thank you. Well it's um it's a pleasure to to be with you and to have this opportunity to present to the group. Um so um, I'm a PhD student just finishing actually at uh, the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine and a public health doctor by background um, and what I'm going to do today is talk through um, the qualitative results from uh, the, the PhD work that I did which uh, was an exploratory piece basically looking at uh, system resilience and childhood vaccination delivery systems um, and in a specific setting of Lebanon uh, and I'll come back uh, in, in some detail as to why I thought that was an interesting context in which to look at these questions. Um, so just to emphasize the results that are presented are qualitative only, and so they draw on the CLD development um, component of the project. There is some simulation work which is ongoing, but I don't have results from that to share. And actually one of the things <clears throat> I was hoping to sort of raise today um, for discussion with the group uh, was to draw in some, some thoughts and perspectives from those who've done perhaps more of the simulation modeling uh, side of things when it comes to system resilience and thinking about the sorts of considerations to bear in mind with that. Um, so just in terms of why uh, focus on vaccination delivery, and I'll, I'll come uh, in a second to, to the context. Um, I, I mean, really, this was driven by the fact that uh, vaccination is, is pretty much one of the most effective public health interventions available. Um, and it's usually a priority in acute responses uh, for domestic and international actors in humanitarian settings. But we know that these sorts of contexts, um, conflict and uh, affected and fragile uh, settings and humanitarian settings more generally, are often ones where coverage for key antigens, so key vaccinations, are amongst the lowest worldwide. And so if you look at something like third dose diphtheria, tetanus and um, pertussis vaccination, which is really one of the WHO's benchmark indicators for how effectively a vaccination delivery system is working, a huge proportion of the infants worldwide that have not received that dose uh, live in these sorts of contexts. And we also know that a, a disproportionate number of the children worldwide who have had no doses of some of the really key vaccinations live in, in these sorts of environments. And uh, there are many sort of reasons for this, but one of the obvious uh, reasons is that um, population movement, which tends to be a real feature in these sorts of contexts, can be incredibly disruptive for the delivery of routine health services like vaccination. Um, so uh, in these sorts of contexts, there's an awful lot of interest at the moment in, in how you get to having resilient health systems. And it's worth dwelling briefly on what, you know, in this project we used as the sort of driving definition of that. Uh, and I've given it here. So this comes from a, a health systems paper, and it's a definition that's widely used in the health systems literature, although interestingly, um, some you know points of difference with the way in which resilience is understood in, in other uh, disciplines, which perhaps is, is something to pick up a bit later on. Uh, but the, uh, the key thing to emphasize about this definition for, from the perspective of this project is that it's dynamic. So we're very interested in this triumvirate of system absorption, adaptation or transformation in response to a shock uh, and thinking about ways in which you might pick up some of those behaviors and, and understand how they look. Um, and uh, so in terms of the, the problem to be addressed in general terms, so this is still you know divorced a little bit from the context but we're thinking about the problem in general here uh 
everything that we know from the literature that's out there at the moment suggests that vaccination coverage is at risk of being seriously disrupted over time in humanitarian settings. And that leads to a whole host of downstream risks. Um, obviously, first and foremost among those, uh, the risk of an increase in the incidence and the severity of vaccine preventable diseases. And some of these have quite significant mortality and morbidity profiles, especially amongst um, you know, young children, other vulnerable segments of the population. But the point is that we don't really have a particularly clear understanding of what sort of system characteristics or capacities explain why some are better able to respond uh, to uh, shocks in humanitarian context than others. And on the other hand, thinking about what works in terms of um, strengthening resilience over the long term. So that's really the sort of problem of focus for the project. And in terms of the context, um, so the, the project was entirely focused on Lebanon um, and a couple of sort of contextual features to bear in mind here, but just so people know where Lebanon is, it's a country in, in the Middle East and it's highlighted here in red. Uh, and for this project, one of the really salient features is it's a direct neighbor of Syria, which has been, as you know, in conflict uh, for many years now. Uh, and has received a very large number of uh, refugees displaced from Syria, and I'll come back to that in a second. But the focus of that displacement is quite sort of inequitably distributed across the country. So uh, certainly in the initial phases after the, um, uh, the beginning of the conflict and when population movement was most intense, you saw an awful lot of refugees. Uh, residing in these sort of border areas uh, of Lebanon, bordering Syria, where historically health service provision had been a little bit patchier for population in general. This is not just for refugees, it's for, for uh, <clears throat> uh, long-term residents of, of Lebanon too. And the other things to bear in mind about Lebanon, uh, uh, you know, even before all of this happened, uh, it's a pretty uh, complicated political and macroeconomic context in Lebanon. The governance arrangement is quite unusual. Uh, and there'd been a high level of sort of economic vulnerability um, over some years, actually linking back to long-term impacts from the civil war, which um, lasted from 1975 to 1990 and other factors. And in terms of how the health system, um, a very fragmented system in terms of governance arrangements, but service delivery arrangements too. And that applied just as much in vaccination delivery, actually, where there was a whole patchwork of different actors involved in providing vaccinations to different populations. So you had uh, quite a small publicly supported network of primary healthcare centres uh, delivering vaccinations to uh, different populations. So that's very much the focus of this project. A very big uh, and loosely regulated private sector, which before the Syria conflict provided the majority of, of routine immunisations to children in Lebanon. Uh, charitable and third sector providers um, and then a variety of other actors that emerged in response to um, growing needs following uh, population displacement from Syria. So quite a complicated sort of environment uh, for service delivery. And into this general mix, you get a whole series of uh, systemic shocks arising in pretty short succession uh, with impacts overlapping. And as, as I'll pick up in later slides, one of the really interesting features of what happened in Lebanon is that you get a degree of interaction between the effects of these different shocks over time. So at the beginning of the project, the primary focus was on uh, the large scale refugee movement that I've described. But over the course of the research that we were doing, we also had to take into account uh, the impact of COVID, you know, big systemic shock. Um, the Beirut blast, so this was a very large explosion that happened right in the heart of Beirut in, in summer 2020. And for vaccination delivery, the significance of that was that it knocked out the, uh, the national vaccine storage warehouse. Um, and also destroyed a number of clinics in the Beirut area. So there were some important implications in the short term, at least for vaccination delivery. And then, uh, you know, really big feature of the current context is uh, an ongoing and really severe political and particularly economic crisis. And the impacts of that I'll, I'll come back to in more detail later on. Um, so this is the kind of trend uh, that um, we were trying to explain in this project. It's really um, showing variations in vaccination coverage uh, for key antigens over time. And what I've done here is pick out 
coverage of first dose um, measles containing vaccination, which is this trend line here. And along the bottom, you have bars representing the total number of measles cases reported over time uh, in Lebanon. And what you see aligning to some degree with some of these different shocks, so the refugee influx to start off with, and then the compound crisis, which is the sort of composite of COVID, um, the Beirut blast and the political and economic crisis that I described earlier, all of which overlap very closely in time uh, happening uh, here. And alongside that, quite significant declines in, in coverage for this really key uh, vaccination. And the background here is that we usually say in public health that unless you've got a population coverage of 95% or more for measles, because it's such a transmissible infection, you're likely to have outbreaks. And so you can see, you know, really large drop off from that sort of threshold of 95 and um, towards the end of the period for which data are currently available. <clears throat> And uh, in terms of reference modes, um, so this was sort of the set of scenarios that we were looking at for this project, a sort of optimal response scenario, which is the top line where after the point of impact of a shock, which is denoted by the vertical red line, uh, you get a bit of um, a short term setback in terms of uh, vaccination coverage over time, but it then bounces back quite well to show a gradual appreciation over time leveling off at some threshold point which is you know above the threshold for population protection in the suboptimal response which is the light blue line you get a much weaker recovery settling at a lower threshold and the failure sort of scenario is this yellow line which is uh, meant to know basically no recovery at all and settling at a new a uh, equilibrium which is well below the threshold for population protection. So these reference modes were really to sort of help try and inform the um, uh, the uh, uh, the modelling component, which, as I said, I won't be reporting on here. So just in terms of what we did in this project. Um, the approach uh, uh, used here was qualitative, but it was focused on individual stakeholder interviews and an analysis of that using an approach called purposive text analysis. Uh, and so that draws particularly on um, this paper, uh, which was published in, in SDR uh, at the beginning of last year, for how you can go through a sort of rigorous and structured process for interpreting uh, quotes in interview transcripts to look for causal language. And from individual transcripts with stakeholders working at different levels of the system, uh, we then built up individual CLDs. And we went through a sort of phase process of combining um, causal loop diagrams to produce an aggregated causal loop diagram, which um, sort of builds what we hope is a, a fairly complete picture of what was going on. And that followed a stepwise process. I'm very happy to come back to the details of, of this later on if anybody's interested. But we held a set of uh, interviews from the overall group of 38 uh, stakeholders in reserve uh, to validate the, the causal loop diagram uh, that we came up with. And again, I'm very happy to go over that in more detail if anybody's interested later on, because it's um, a less common approach, I guess, than um, you know, for example, group model building, which is often used in these sorts of contexts. And there were specific reasons why we chose not to use GMB for this project. Um, so what I'm going to go through over the next few slides is a series of results from the CLD development. And what we were really trying to do here was two things. Um, one was to identify what you might think of as pathways of threat uh, or potentially leverage points, to use uh, Donella Meadows' language, that um, have the ability, it would appear, to amplify shock effects within the system. So that was one element of what we were trying to do analytically. And then the second part was to think about potential mitigation strategies to address uh, vulnerabilities highlighted by those pathways of threat. And that included things that have already been implemented in some way or another in the system in Lebanon, uh, and then ones that haven't, which were identified through a, uh, a literature review, which was carried out separately. 
Um, there's quite a lot going on in this, but what this diagram is meant to represent is a sort of bird's eye view of the whole CLD, which uh, in, in detail looks quite a lot more complicated than this. But what you have here is the major shocks that we were interested in here, identified in green text. You've got the refugee influx here, um, COVID-19 basically proxied by this variable. And then the economic crisis proxied by household income here. Um, I'll come back later to why the Beirut blast didn't feature on this. And what we were trying to do is map out some of the major pathways of, of impact linked to each of those um, shocks. Uh, and I think one of the things I want to highlight from this is that it helped identify pretty quickly some of the key delays that interviewees had identified as influencing the capacity and capability of the system to respond in a timely way to each of the shocks. So for refugee arrivals, for example, I've just picked out by highlighting in red a couple of the really um, important pathways there. There were critical delays in, for example, the time taken for national and international actors to perceive the scale and scope of the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Lebanon, uh, which in turn influenced how quickly humanitarian response funding could be mobilized. And that's uh, really this sort of first set of delays here. Um, there's I guess some rather more intuitive or predictable delays in terms of vaccine procurement um, at a national level and then disbursement uh, down to facility level to enable uh, delivery. Uh, and that's picked up in, in these sets of delays here. And in the early stages of the response to the Syria crisis, an awful lot of that was driven by cold chain constraints. So in other words, problems in terms of being able to ensure that uh, vaccine doses were refrigerated in a, at an appropriate temperature in a complete pathway all the way from the National Vaccine Storage Warehouse down to facility level uh, because there were some quite significant weaknesses at different points of the system um, at the beginning of the crisis, although that, that improved uh, significantly over time. Uh, this is uh, zooming into a sort of meso level picture focusing on one specific domain of the vaccine delivery system in Lebanon. So this is looking at uh, the supply chain element. Um, uh, and again, just picked out some of the really key delays in terms of disbursement of doses to local level in, in these bold blue uh, delay lines, uh, just for illustration. Uh, and an awful lot uh, of this is, you know, as I said earlier, about movement of stuff. In other words, there are material delays within the system, but there also are quite important information delays at play here. So, for example, this delay right at the top of the, uh, the diagram, uh, and that really is about the delay it, in time it took to produce reasonable estimates of likely vaccine requirements on a national level. Uh, and that was for a number of reasons. So some of it was about, uh, you know, quite simply uncertainty about how many refugees had moved in because the scale and the pace of the movement was such that uh, agencies couldn't keep up with numbers. And you had an awful lot of people moving informally who in the early stages were not registered with uh, UNHCR, for example, uh, the major agency operating uh, in Lebanon at the time to, to deal with this. And the challenge of trying to capture some of this information through a routine health information systems. So that fed into quite a, an important delay in the early phases in terms of coming up with realistic projections of how many vaccines would be needed uh, to meet new population level demands. But you also see through through some of this work um, evidence of where buffer effects were important. And so I just want to highlight this this loop here in the middle, this balancing loop. Um, and this is really about uh, the, the response to um, later shocks. So in this case, uh, it's about the effect of the economic crisis. And, and one of those uh, was around the capacity to ensure cold storage capacity at facility level. Uh, so one of the adaptive responses that was put in place following uh, the arrival of refugees from Syria was the introduction of solar fridges at facility level, which were imported. And the idea was you were less reliant on electricity supplies from the mains electricity sources, 
uh, and could use these solar fridges to maintain the cold chain at facility level. So in the short term, that was quite important actually for improving the capacity of facilities to be able to deliver vaccinations because previously they simply couldn't guarantee the cold chain to local level. The problem during the economic crisis was that uh, import restrictions meant that getting access to spare parts for these fridges, all of which had been imported, became much, much more difficult. Uh, and so actually maintenance became a real issue for, for, for some of the solar fridges. And, and that meant that it was, again, harder to ensure uh, cold storage capacity at facility level. So what you started to see was a bit of a cycling back effect uh, between facilities and uh, district level uh, sort of distribution centers where facilities would simply send back doses to the, the district level facilities because they knew that they had a bit more security when it came to electricity supply there. And it meant that you didn't get vaccine wastage because um, you couldn't maintain the cold chain at the facility level. Um, the implication of that, of course, was that you had fewer doses available at facility level in order to give to patients and so that made facilities a little bit less responsive uh, to fluctuations in demand than they had been earlier. So that's quite an important sort of rate limiting uh, effect um, which was exacerbated by other things. So there were some other adaptive responses that uh, facilities tried to put in place to manage these challenges including things like using fuel power generators but again, one of the issues in the economic crisis was that availability of fuel um, has become a real issue and it's become increasingly expensive to try to run generators that way. So facilities very often can't do it. So um, moving on slightly to think about interactions, one of, one of the um, sort of driving questions for this work was to try to understand what happens in situations where a system isn't just exposed to one shock, but is exposed to multiple shocks overlapping in, in time and space. Uh, and so there's quite a lot of work in you know, the climate and environmental science uh, literature on things like compound hazards and risks arising from those but there's been very little of this way in fact practically none actually in uh, in the health systems literature so we were thinking about what this might look like in the context of health systems um, and what we found through the CLD work was a number of important areas of the system uh, where different shocks interact in slightly different ways to amplify risks um, in ways that weren't necessarily anticipatable um, initially. And one of these um, concerned demand shift in terms of the way that people were accessing vaccination. So the really important background here is that, that uh, in Lebanon, historically, uh, host communities, in other words, Lebanese citizens, had traditionally had quite a high degree of scepticism towards services provided through publicly supported clinics. They tended to think of them as, as lower quality for whatever reason and tended to equate uh, charging of fees in the private sector with denoting higher quality of service provision in, in that sector. So they tended to go to private providers for vaccination. Um, and what happened in the initial phases of uh, the, the Syria crisis was that uh, because a policy decision was made quite early on to open up publicly supported clinics uh, to refugees from Syria so that they could access vaccination through those sources. And this was all in the interest of trying to protect you know, the wider population from uh, outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases. That really amplified this demand shift from Lebanese away from publicly supported providers. So they t it tended to reinforce this sense of um, the cost of vaccination being a marker of uh, of quality and, and hence use um, of the private sector to get vaccinated. And that's really what this reinforcing loop was, was trying to denote here. Uh, but what happened as the economic crisis took hold uh, was that as household income amongst Lebanese declined, uh, this variable willingness to pay for vaccination became much more important in driving behaviour. So frankly, households could no longer afford to pay for vaccination in, in the way that they used to. Uh, and so what happened then was a big demand shift back the other way uh, as host communities from Lebanon started to move increasingly towards these publicly supported clinics. Uh, 
capacity was being expanded in that part of the system significantly anyway uh, in order to access vaccination that way and, and that of course then meant a, a reduced uptake amongst private clinics many of whom were struggling to access vaccine doses anyway because they imported them or accessed them through uh, import agents which is becoming more difficult because of the economic crisis so this is just one example of a number uh, where different shocks sort of interacted on a specific part of the system to shift behavior in subtly different ways depending on what the shock was and I guess one of the interesting take-homes from this is that uh, you know the economic crisis was really sort of transformative in terms of the way that it shifted uh, behavior previous shocks had, had tended to reinforce this pre-existing behavioral pattern but the economic crisis really turned everything on its head uh, we also had a look at what system transformation might look like so this goes back to that definition of resilience i put up right at the beginning um, so we were keen to to think a little bit more about what it means for a transformational change to happen within a system in response to a shock uh, and there's really very little consensus on this in the literature in health or indeed I would say more generally in, in the literature on, uh, on system resilience uh, and so all we can do here is present some indicative uh, material and what this set of loops is intended to represent here uh, is something around the emergence of a wholly new structure uh, to support the integration of private providers into the system of publicly supported uh, clinics for, for vaccination delivery. So historically, as I said earlier, the private sector had operated very much on its own terms. It delivered most of the vaccinations, but crucially, they source vaccinations in their own way and they didn't report data to the Ministry of Public Health. So when you look at uh, estimates of vaccination coverage from Lebanon, one of the major caveats for those data series tends to be that estimates of coverage deriving from the private sector are very much finger in the air because they don't officially report any data from the Ministry of Public Health. So they sort of have to make a, a general estimate of what they think is going on in terms of delivery in, in that part of the health sector. Um, and at the beginning of the Syria crisis, what the Ministry of Public Health did was to put in place uh, an agreement with private clinics uh, that they would, uh, it was a memorandum of understanding essentially, that they would deliver uh, vaccines for free um, uh, to Syrians and indeed to, to Lebanese in exchange for access to free vaccine vials from the Ministry of Public Health, which had very good security of supply because it, it, those vaccine doses were procured through UNICEF. Um, what happened initially was that there was very weak uptake of that, uh, that proposed mechanism by the private sector simply because there was no incentive for them to do it. So fees that were charged through the private sector for vaccination were pretty high and they made quite a lot of money out of, out of this arrangement. So there was no incentive for them to move to a different model of working. Again, the economic crisis really sort of shifted uh, that pattern of behavior uh, and in fact turned it on its head. Private providers could no longer access vaccine doses, anything like as readily as, as they used to, so they didn't have any vaccines to give people. But it, equally, people were increasingly not going to private providers because they knew they would have to pay a hefty fee in order to be vaccinated. Uh, and an awful lot of people simply don't have the money in Lebanon to be able to do that anymore. So you saw a much, much uh, stronger uptake of this offer from the Ministry of Public Health, the never growing number of private clinics sort of coming into the fold, accessing free vaccine doses from the ministry and in exchange having to report uptake data. But from their perspective, the incentive was that they got to hold on to their patients, which um, they otherwise might not have been able to do. So this is a new sort of set of structures that emerged in response to the Syria crisis and the following shocks, in particular the economic crisis, then really reinforced. So it may represent an example of transformational change in one part of the vaccination delivery system, but obviously uh, not overall. So I'm sort of approaching the, the end now, and I just want to conclude with a, a couple of sort of summary slides. So the, the first of uh, these is, is this one, which is a very busy slide. Uh, but what it tries to do is to summarize findings across the project um, 
uh, in Lebanon using Donella Meadows framework of leverage points. We sort of divided these into four categories. So you have, you know, fairly low order changes around events near the top of the table and these changes uh, around sort of the mental model governing a system which um, Meadows argues are the ones that are really likely to lead to transformational change near the bottom. Uh, and there are a couple of things to pick out from this uh, in terms of system resilience. Um, one of the main observations is that an awful lot of what was done in Lebanon in order to try to bolster the resilience of the system was really sort of tweaking things pretty, uh, you know, low down the list of um, leverage points that Meadows identified as likely to have an impact on the system. So the, the implication is that, you know, if, if you believe her sort of division of uh, of leverage points, probably not going to have a huge amount of impact. Um, by contrast, really only one or two sort of changes at the level of mental models, most of which are around things like eligibility of different population groups to access vaccination through different uh, delivery points uh, and making vaccination um, basically free of charge to Syrian refugees through the publicly supported uh, clinic network. And that was a really major policy change in terms of what had happened historically in Lebanon. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the work in this project, though, is that um, uh, the suggestion is that actually, you know, these some of these event level changes uh, and changes around the level of patterns of behaviour. So thinking particularly about financial inputs into the into the system uh, are really significant, actually, and can be transformational. Uh, it's just that in Lebanon, as in many other humanitarian settings, the level of funding required to support uh, an increase in delivery capacity to meet demand simply uh, isn't there and is unlikely to be in the foreseeable future because humanitarian fundraising can't simply can't respond to the needs of this sort of scale. So there's a lot more to say about this, but it's just a, a sort of way of tying some of these findings together. So to summarize, um, I just want to pick out a couple of what I think are the, the most important findings from this work, really. Um, the first is that there are some fairly clearly identifiable delays that seem to affect the timeliness of um, shock responses in vaccination delivery, pretty much irrespective of the shock. Um, and an awful lot of those, frankly, have to do with fairly predictable um, material delays around the disbursement of vaccine doses from national down to local and information delays in terms of you know, awareness within the system of where populations who need vaccinating might be um, and, and how you sort of marshal that through health information systems. Um, it's fairly obvious that shock responses are, are contingent on existing vulnerabilities and, and a very good example of that is this historical reliance uh, amongst host communities on accessing vaccination through the private sector. That was a system that really collapsed uh, in the early months of the economic crisis because it was an obvious point of vulnerability um, uh, in the face of uh, declining relative household incomes. Um, thirdly, different shocks can interact in quite unexpected ways uh, and to amplify risk or even to shift behaviour and that, that again in terms of the, the uh, the uptake behaviour shift that I described a few slides around ago between the private sector and, and publicly supported clinics is an important example there. Um, and these two last points are, are the ones that I'd be really interested to pick up um, with people here or perhaps offline later for those who, who might watch the recording. Thinking about what this all means in terms of assessing resilience, what sorts of measures or metrics might be relevant uh, it would appear from the CLDs as though delay-based measures uh, are clearly going to be quite important for assessing system resilience. Uh, but obviously, these are just indicative findings because they're based on qualitative work and aren't supported by simulation money at this point. And then in terms of interventions, one of the really striking features of what happened in Lebanon in response to all of these shocks was that a whole package of different interventions were implemented at various different points in time and working at different points in the system. Some of them were, you know, facility level, uh, for example, task shifting. So moving away from a system where doctors delivered the vaccines primarily to one where nurses delivered the vaccines. And that was both a way of 
increasing vaccination delivery capacity, but also constraining cost to patients. Um, but some macro level changes too, in terms of the way that funding was, was mobilized. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I just want to put this up by way of thanks, really an awful lot of people to thank um, uh, in terms of supporting the project funding uh, from the Wellcome Trust in this case and, and various others who've advised at various different points um, and would be really interested in any thoughts or reflections on uh, what I've said today. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif. It was a really great presentation and really um, insightful. Uh, and it it's, it's gives a remarkable overview how complex this problem is and how different elements of the system are really um, yeah, integrated to each other and, and, and how one part affects the other part. Um, yeah, there was one uh, question also in the um, chat. Would you be uh, so kind to explain a little bit more about the purposive text analysis approach you obtained uh, and also can you explain a little bit more how you use this approach to validate the structure of your model yes of course um so the uh the approach um is is predicated on having textual information as as your sort of primary data uh the CLD construction and the idea is that you basically carry out a form of thematic analysis so you go through the transcripts and, and segment the text uh, and then through that identify basically causal segments so in in the text you identify language that seems to describe a variable and you code the variable and then you pick out language that describes where there are causal links between variables and describes what those, uh, you know, the direction or the nature of those causal relationships might be. Um, and through a sort of purpose of aggregate, uh, through a process of aggregation, you build that up then into a, a, a CLD for an individual. Uh, so you, you take all of these sort of text segments, you map out the variables and the causal links and you construct a diagram from that um, in terms of uh, what you then do to aggregate that uh, it's a sort of stage process so um, I mean the, the paper from Andrada and, and colleagues which is in the slide deck gives a lot more detail but just to sort of summarize the process briefly um, you're basically uh, running through a process where you you take a group of stakeholders and, and their individual CLDs, you start with the most complex CLD in terms of how complex the representation is of what's happening in the system. You use that as an anchor and you then look at, in, in order of complexity, the following CLDs to see if there are additional structural elements from those CLDs that are not captured in the original one. Uh, and if so, you add those two to the, the original causal loop diagram. And so this is a sort of iterative process. You go through this over several steps uh, to build up an aggregated CLD. Um, the next step is to sort of prune it. So again, trying to retain only those um, structural parts of the diagram that you think are most important in terms of driving the behavior and, and when I say that you think are most important there's a there's a process for the pruning so initially you just um, uh, I think the final I, I have to you know um, review the details but the final step is that you retain for example only feedbacks with three or more links within it so it's not like you're making an arbitrary decision about which part of the structure to retain or which not there's a sort of structure process for how you prune so that's the construction of the diagram initially um, the validation process is is really then uh, doing something similar, but using this reserve set of interviews that you've held back explicitly for the validation um, process. Um, and the idea here basically is that you're looking for anything that's new, new variables, new new links, uh, new delays, new feedbacks that come from those, um, those validation interviews, uh, and then adjusting the diagram to include those structures. So it's really a sort of sense check. And um, uh, in, in this project, uh, which is something that Andrade and colleagues have, have also done in, in their own work, you can sort of plot out 
uh, what's happening in terms of the saturation. So you might start with perhaps the first validation interview, adding a few variables, maybe a couple of links, maybe one feedback. But over time, you see that progressively the number of new pieces of material, a variable, a link, other structural aspects being added, levels off. And so that's the point at which you, you have an increasing degree of confidence, I guess, that the representation you've got uh, accords with what a, a fairly good cross-section of stakeholders from the system uh, think the system looks like and how it functions um, in response to the, the problem that you're trying to describe. Um, I mean, Obviously, that's a very different sort of process from going through group model building, uh, where conventionally you would do that sort of thing in a room with the people and through discussion, you know, arrive at that sort of consensus model. But the end outcome is the same. It's just that the way that you're arriving at that consensus is slightly different. Um, and there are then other validation steps that you can take. So in this project, once we had produced an aggregate CLD and validated it using this reserve set of interviews, we then went back to the major stakeholder for the whole project and sense checked the causal loop diagram with them um, qualitatively to see if there was anything that they fundamentally disagreed with about the strut. Yeah, um, I was wondering with your project, um, since, since it's, it's, it looks like you have quite a, a, a scattered group of stakeholders in terms of their physical location, at least this is how I perceive the the, um, the program. Um, on the other hand, you could use a virtual setting for group model building. Why didn't you choose that option uh, not? Of wh why didn't you choose the way you worked and, and did not use group model building? Uh, so that, that's a really good question. And I, I think um, a, a number of things. So some, uh, quite a lot of the considerations were practical, actually. So, um, you know, we were quite concerned about um, managing power relations. And, and that's for the simple reason that, that, so just in terms of who we were talking to here, we were talking to sort of national level stakeholders in, in you know, the Ministry of Health, um, people working for donors, people in implementing partner organizations, non-governmental organizations operating on the ground, and those working service delivery, and some really quite awkward power relations to manage there in, in terms of like lines of accountability. So in the room, you would have had people who were directly in receipt of funding, from other people who are in the room, uh, which we felt would have made managing a group model building exercise really pretty challenging. Um, some of it was about language, um, you know, we're operating in the Middle East, um, large differences in terms of the, the language in which people were most comfortable operating. And so there was an aspect of uh, trying to manage that process. But the final and, and really sort of key element was trying to do this during COVID. Uh, which, uh, you know, initially it, it started as a project that was being delivered in person on, on the ground and that, that had to change, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. Um, so uh, we didn't at that stage pursue an online process because actually, you know, there wasn't much in the way of a literature for online group middle building to, to build off, although I know there have been some really significant developments in that space. Um, over the past sort of two years. So I think it's something for the future that I would personally be very interested to look at. Well, well I, I think you, you might still may, uh, yeah, remain the risk of, of the power struggle, which basically I can imagine that's a really important factor here to consider for getting the right insights for your project. Mika, you want to, to uh, ask a question, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Um... I'm sorry, I leave my camera out because the uh, the uh, internet here is really poor. So, uh, um, no problem. But uh, thanks for the nice presentation. It was uh, it was very good to uh, to hear. And uh, I was I was wondering about one thing. Um, one of the in one of the loops, you suggest that maybe uh, using more mobile uh, facilities for vaccinations may be an advantage to, you know. Uh, uh, more, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, locations uh, in different places. And I think, you know, the the, uh, the, ch the choice between making 
uh, facilities mobile uh, in contrast to to in fixed places is a choice that you know many uh, in many situations goes. So uh, you know it goes for for healthcare, but maybe also schooling, or maybe also uh, you know um, uh, safety things. Or so I was wondering, can you can you draw some general conclusions on you know when you make the choice for the one when the one will be better or uh, when um, uh, when the other would be uh, preferable in, in, a, in a, maybe in this situation or maybe in any situation. So that that's a really good question, um, and I'll, I'll, I'm not sure that there is a definitive answer to it. But I'll I'll just say a little bit about what what happened in um, in in Lebanon. So I, th I think the one of one of the trade-offs here is is um well i mean there's a trade-off in terms of accessibility and cost fundamentally because mobile health mm -hmm. teams uh you know tend to be a more cost intensive model by comparison with you know having people at a fixed site and that's both about economies of scale uh, but also just you know the fact of things like fuel and, and other accessory costs that go with uh, using mobile approaches so um uh, the way in which they have been used in Lebanon to greatest effect is is probably in the most intensive period of disruption after a shock. So they were used extensively uh, in the immediate aftermath of the major refugee arrivals from Syria, and that was um, largely a response to the fact that you had people um, in large numbers living in informal settings who were not registered and they were not in camps and it was you know quite frankly they didn't know their way around the system at all anyway I and mean, they wouldn't have known where to go to fix sites so in terms of being able to deliver vaccinations efficiently that was uh, you know deemed to be a pretty good model to pursue in the initial phases uh, there was a real sort of drawing back from that model later on uh, as the refugee population became more settled. Uh, large numbers still living in informal settlements, but those settlements were themselves a little bit more stable in terms of population churn. So, you know, it became easier to access people to improve awareness around wh which fixed access points they could go to to access vaccination. Um, and and a similar sort of picture in the context of the economic crisis that, you know, that sort of policy decision of drawing back from using mobile medical units was reversed relatively recently, actually, in the context of, you know, rapidly worsening economic conditions. But the driver then was different. So the argument was, well, people quite frankly, quite often can't afford to pay for transport to come to facilities. So we increasingly are going to have to go to them in order to deliver these, these vaccinations. Um, so the driver was, uh, you know, slightly sort of different in each in each case. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, a, you know, go ahead. The loop in Sorry. itself, uh, so, so uh, what you say is uh, um, mobile services are, are uh, most effective during or just, you know, after crisis. And then what happens? People get settled, and uh, they get, and and then you uh, organize fixed locations, and then there's budget cuts, and then you know the number of fixed locations go down, and then what happens is you identify, uh, you know, subpopulations that are that you don't reach anymore, and then uh, again here enters uh, mobile locations because you want to reach those people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a clear another clear sort of point of interaction for the different shocks that you know it's sort of pushing behavior and I mean broadly the same sort of way but for slightly different reasons depending on what the shock is so I th I think this is one of the I mean you're absolutely right because it's a very good point and it's one of the most interesting things about this project has been to try to identify those signature bits of the structure of the system uh, which seem almost irrespective of the shock to be points at which uh, you know really significant changes can happen one way or the other um, and from a, a resilience perspective that in a way is the most interesting finding because it suggests that you know all the resources that go into you know wider activities are all well and good but actually where we should really be focusing our attention is these particular structural points where there are there are vulnerabilities thank you very much yeah um 
Sharif, uh, there's uh, you also ask some uh, input from our side. Fine. It's um, about resilience, uh, and I'm happy to share some insights I observe when talking about cyber resilience, and it might be relevant to your project as well. Um, one element what is really important in the field of uh, managing cyber risk is time. And okay. there are three elements that, that are important. One is what is the moment of time when a certain event is going to start? And in cyber, it's usually the adversary, but the most important part is this, the system is affected by a non an emerging event, but what the system needs to resolve. And then you have your um, second element. This is basically when can, um, yeah, in case of, of uh, security, when can the defender observe that? So when can the system observe that it's being impacted by an emerging event? And yeah. this is already your first time differences. And then your, your uh, second time difference is what time do you need to intervene? Uh, and that basically started to, to, to mitigate the effect of the event. Um, what you specifically see in, in cyber risk management is that, that you have uh, always, you have ecosystems that con consist of multiple subsystems and each of those subsystems have the ability to intervene, but they always have a limit that, um, uh, yeah, capacity that's available. And often you see that an impact of an event goes beyond that capacity of a subsystem. And now uh, the effect of that emerging event spills over to another part of the system and triggering the same mechanism. And most important part is when can you stop that cascade of, of yeah, subsystems being impacted? Because if you don't stop that, then you move to crisis that ultimately cause an organization to, to yeah, go out of business because of the breach. And I think you're, you have a similar way in, in your ecosystem. You can have multiple events that the system tries to, to yeah, uh, mitigate and absorb. But if there's too much, the system might collapse. Um, the second element, what is specifically about cyber uh, resilience is that, um, that that research focus on performance and not only to go back to the state prior to the event, but also they try to in-capture the learnings of the system. So the performance basically excels after the event and basically meaning one, you're not susceptible for the event again. And the second part is you try to go back to your performance where you want to be in your original planning. And, and if you have a growth scenario in performance, you basically uh, take the necessary steps to go back to that growth scenario. So there's some kind of, yeah, learning and acceleration mechanism into the system. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting, actually. And I, I mean, I think um, you see kind of quite striking examples of of all of those things, um, you know, occurring in Lebanon. I think one. So on on your second point, one of the general sort of points that really strikes me at the moment, particularly when we're talking about you know, future risks arising from climate hazards is is kind of when do you get the opportunity to to do that learning? Uh, and one of the things about the system in Lebanon was is you get the the sense of uh, basically being buffeted by almost constant shocks without an ability ever to sort of have clear headspace to do that that learning and think uh, what next. Uh, in the context of a system that was already operating under really profound resource constraints, both human and and financial, um, so it's it's an interesting, I guess, question to think about how on earth we 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 would build that ability in for systems in the future, given what's probably coming down the road for all of us. Mm -hmm. So we all almost are at the top of the hour. And, and yeah, I find it really fascinating and really interesting research. And, and thank you for presenting at our SIG and allow us to, to, to make this yeah, great record of, of this presentation. Are there any final words someone wants to share? Um, I don't, uh, you've answered so many of the questions that I had as well, but thank you. This was <clears throat> very interesting. Um, my own, uh, research for for my dissertation is also uh, within resilience and resistance, but it's the resistance of a 
military to um, adapt and prevent a takeover. So uh, although it sounds different, it's it. I think it's very similar. I'm also looking at the underlying structure that's needed to maintain resilience from you know a human capacity as a, as opposed to a, a vaccination capacity. But I see a lot of similarities. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you all for joining and I, I will make sure I, I look up more about your work and the SIGS work because I'm very keen to, to find out more and to link in more in the future. So everybody, thanks for joining uh, the SIGS uh, session today. Thank you for the great presentation and I wish everybody uh, a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye.